Good morning, this is Marshall Davis. The topic of this episode came from a Zoom talk that I did recently, just a couple of days ago actually. The leader of a non-dual group in a nearby town here in New, Hamp New Hampshire asked me to do a 90-minute satsang with his folks and others from the non-dual community. And when I got the, the Zoom link that he sent me, it had the title, Jesus as Non-Dual Teacher. So, that got me thinking about this topic. I, I thought I would give some thoughts on the subject in this 15-minute episode, some of which I said in that Zoom talk and some which I never did get to in that, that Zoom talk. And I've talked about these things before, but here they're all in one place, just in 15 minutes or so. The first thing I need to say about Jesus as a non-dual teacher is that the language of Jesus and the Gospels is not the typical language of non-duality that we hear these days. Neither Jesus nor the early Christians used words like enlightenment, or awakening, or liberation, and certainly not terms that have been taken from Hindu tradition and Buddhist tradition, terms like moksha or samadhi or nirvana. Instead, Jesus used terms like rebirth, and not meaning reincarnation, but being spiritually reborn. He spoke of being born of the Spirit, born anew, born from above, and of course that term born again, which was later appropriated and redefined by evangelical Christianity. And that is the problem with Christians understanding what Jesus was actually saying, because they've changed the meaning of that term. What Jesus meant by that term is not what Evangelical Christianity means by the term. Jesus used these terms, especially in John chapter 3, to refer to what is called enlightenment, or what we might define or describe as opening to reality, or the one reality, a non-dual reality. Jesus experienced this reality at his baptism which was the seminal event in his life. It was his awakening experience, although it is not called that in the Gospels. All four Gospels picture this as the event that transformed his life and gave him a message to proclaim. He called it the Kingdom of God. The event and experience itself is pictured in the baptism story in symbolic language because only symbolism can describe it. There are no words to describe it directly. <clears throat> the Gospels say that when Jesus came up from the waters of the Jordan River that the heavens opened. That means there was an opening to divine reality. The story says that the Spirit of God descended upon him like a dove. This is the anointing of the Holy Spirit, which is why Jesus came to be called the Christ, which means anointed one. And the symbol of the dove represents peace. It also represents recreation. It is a symbol borrowed from the flood story, which was the recreation of the world after its global baptism in water. It is death and rebirth, destruction and recreation, the end of the, the old self or old reality and the emergence of a, a new self, the seeing of a new reality. Lastly, the baptism accounts say that there was a voice from heaven that names Jesus as God's beloved. This is Jesus' discovery of his true identity, baptized in divine love. 
traditional Christians don't really talk about Jesus' baptism much. The event is not observed in in most church, churches except for the liturgical ones. And even then, it really isn't any big deal. You know, any Christian could tell you when Christmas is or in what season the Easter is, because Easter is always changing the exact date. But do you know when the baptism of the Lord is celebrated? In the church calendar, it is the second Sunday of January. And in most churches, that is lost. People are just tired from Christmas. And it's lost in the midst of New Year. And then Epiphany, if the church celebrates Epiphany. Jesus' baptism is certainly not observed in evangelical churches, at least not like the birth of Jesus, or the death of Jesus, or the resurrection of Jesus. And yet, Jesus' baptism is recorded in all four Gospels, just as much as his death. His birth... We celebrated Christmas as mentioned only in two Gospels, his resurrection in three, his ascension only in one. Yet the baptism of Jesus was what started it all. It is the enlightenment of Jesus. It is why we call him the Christ. Just like Buddha's enlightenment under the Bodhi tree is, is what made him the Buddha. The fact that most churches ignore or downplay this event in Jesus' life is an indication that they don't really know what Jesus or his message are really about. That ignorance is actually stated over and over again in the Synoptic Gospels. The Gospels repeatedly say that the twelve disciples did not understand who Jesus was, or what his message was. It says they did not know his true identity or his true message. We read the Gospels and we get the impression that the disciples, the original disciples, were clueless. Furthermore, the church that canonized the New Testament that put these Gospels into the Bible did not understand who Jesus was and what he was about. They made it all about doctrines you had to believe about Jesus and about God and about rules and about ecclesiastical structures and who is in and who is out, which is exactly what Jesus spoke against. A minority of the earliest Christians did get it. The Apostle John got it. The Gospel of John is the most non-dual of the four Gospels. In fact, it is the only non-dual Gospel in the canon. Now, there were other Gospels that did communicate the Gospel of non-duality, but they did not make it into the New Testament. The Gospel of Thomas is the best example of this, and there are others also. There's, you can read the Nagamati Library and you can find them. These are documents, these are Gospels and other writings that had been banned, but some churches kept them and hid them and they were discovered in the late 1940s. So now we have them now. So we know that there was a minority movement within early Christianity that knew and transmitted and proclaimed this non-dual gospel of Jesus, but they were marginalized by the mainstream church, which decided they were going to follow Paul and James, neither of whom were among the original twelve apostles of Jesus. In fact, none of the books of the New Testament were written by original disciples of Jesus, and most of the New Testament was written by Paul, who never met Jesus. This woman was not familiar with his teachings, who, who never even quotes Jesus, except for a few words about the Lord's Supper. Christianity, Christianity as we know it today is 
a product of Paul of Tarsus, not Jesus of Nazareth. The minority movement, based on Jesus' original non-dual teachings, were in churches in the 1st and 2nd centuries, and they produced these alternative Gospels that I mentioned a moment ago. In time, in the 3rd and 4th century, these churches and these Christians were gradually marginalized, and so they retreated away from the rest of Christian Christianity. They retreated into the desert as the church became more and more institutionalized and more and more worldly. They are known as the Desert Fathers and Mothers. They were ascetics and hermits. By the 4th century, the gospel of non-duality was seen as dangerous and unchristian and heretical. It was labeled Gnostic and it was outlawed and the books banned. And it was all downhill from there to where we are today, where non-duality is looked upon as something foreign to Christianity rather than as something at its core. It is viewed by many Christians as an intrusion from Eastern religions like Hinduism or Buddhism or Taoism rather than the heart of the original teachings of Jesus. Now what exactly was the original teaching of Jesus. The Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke recorded, even though they don't understand it, they recorded that after his baptism and a 40-day period of integration, and which is a symbolic number by the way, not literal, Jesus began preaching a very simple message. He said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Or in the Gospel of Matthew, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When understood correctly, that, in a nutshell, is the gospel of non-duality. Repent comes from the Latin that means to rethink. And the word that Jesus used in Greek, metanoia or metnao, it means beyond the mind. Jesus was pointing people beyond the mind to a divine reality that he called the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of the Father. That which he had experienced at his baptism. When he said the kingdom of God is at hand, he was talking about a divine reality that is present here and now. That is what the expression at hand mean. means. It means it's so close you can reach out your hand and you can touch it with an, with an arm's reach. Jesus made this meaning very clear when he said that the kingdom of God is within you or in your midst, meaning all around you. He said that the kingdom of God is all around us, but people do not see it. Jesus was pointing people to non-dual reality. Brother Lawrence calls this the presence of God. Like everything else in the Gospels, his message of the kingdom was also misunderstood by the disciples. It was even less understood by the next generation of Christians, the ones who wrote the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The kingdom of God came to be thought of exclusively as a future event that was to occur in history. Now, as a student of scripture, I have to admit that there seems to be an element of that in the original message of the historical Jesus. At least that is the conclusion of the majority of New Testament scholars. They see Jesus as an eschatological preacher. I think it likely that Jesus' message was twofold. Jesus proclaimed the message of the kingdom here and now, within us and all around us, what some scholars call realized eschatology. He also seems to have taught that there would come a time in the future when all mankind would know this reality, when the whole world 
would wake up to non-dual reality, if you will. That idea of an eschatological breaking in of the kingdom of God is in the first three Gospels. The fourth Gospel stresses the kingdom here and now. Running throughout the Gospel of John is a series of I am statements that Jesus makes. They refer back to the name of God found in the story of Moses and the burning bush. God says that God is the I am or the I am that I am. This non-dual teaching reaches its pinnacle in the 17th chapter of John, when Jesus gives his final teaching before he's arrested, it's in the form of a prayer right, be right before he's taken away and he's tried. Jesus prays for future generations who are going to hear his gospel. And he says this. He says, I do not pray for these alone, meaning his disciples right then, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. That's just one small excerpt from, from his prayer there. That message is unmistakably non-dual in nature. It keeps talking about the fact that we are one. This message runs throughout the Gospel of John. It's a point of many of the parables of Jesus and the other Gospels. As I have said elsewhere, Jesus used parables like Zen Cohen's to catapult people into the presence of God. This non-dual teaching is found in the Sermon on the Mount as well, if we look for it. In short, Jesus was a teacher of non-duality. And that's it for today. Grace and peace to you.